Yeah. All right. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Pastor Andrew. Thank you for the lovely song. You ready? Okay. So I have my my preaching today would be divided into two parts. One part one, and then part two after lunch. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> All right. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. So, for everybody, we are in a series called Amazing Grace. And four weeks ago, we started talking about the justifying grace. Okay, so I'm just going to do a very quick review before we go to uh, my topic. This is the last topic about Amazing Grace. Where's Taisa? Yes, I'm talking. Yes, I know. I will slow down. <laughs> I'm going to slow down, so bear with me. You don't have to worry because after the preaching, we have free lunch. Alright? So we're going to fill our spirit with food today and we're going to fill our physical bodies with food later. Alright, why don't we just close our eyes. Lord, you want to thank you, God. Thank you, Father, that today your message is... Um, not just for the few of us, but for everybody, Lord. We want to thank you for your grace, for your amazing grace, God. It's always free for us. We don't deserve it, but still you give us. Thank you, Father, that you're going to speak on behalf of me, God. I pray, Father God, that your message will sh shoot right into the hearts of the people here. In Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, translate to us. You're the only one who is capable of translating this so we could fully understand and we could fully, you know, live out the Word of God in our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. Alright, so, four weeks ago, we started with the justifying grace. Okay, so what is justifying grace? So, we were justified by grace when God saved us. Yeah? God's justifying grace not only saved us, but we became heirs with the hope of eternal life. And because of this justifying grace, we were not only saved from the punishment of our sin, but we can have eternal life in Christ Jesus. Yeah, that's the grace. We are saved not because of our own good works, right? Not good works, but by the grace of God, we have been justified as if we did not sin. Right? And then, we did the sanctifying grace. So after we say, we just don't stop there, right? We don't stop there. It's a continuous process. Sanctifying grace, it, um, this is like the power of grace sanctifies, purifies, and empowers us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passion. Sanctifying grace, it trains us to say no no to sin and temptation and it also helps us live a victorious life doing good works right so after we are saved the grace of god gives us the power to say no to all of this sin that's the one and then on week three we have the sufficient grace do you believe that the grace of god is always enough for us when we say the grace of god it is not for tomorrow not for the future. The grace of God is for today. Amen. That's why God is telling us, you do not worry about tomorrow because what the grace that He gives to you and to me every single day is always enough to cover and to sustain us. Amen? That's why, why, you know, there are some people, they find it hard, oh, I just don't know how am I going to live my life today. When you do not encounter the grace of God, then you would never understand that God will help you get through the day. Right? Get through the day. Because that's a promise. It's His promise. And sufficient grace, according to Apostle Paul, Paul thought as that we should not be focusing on our weaknesses and our struggles. But instead, we have to look up to the grace of God and the power of God to sustain us because in our weaknesses, the power and the grace of God is made perfect. Perfect. And last week, 
Pastor Nick, our very handsome pastor, preached about enriching grace. <laughs> you know, sometimes we just have to, you know, flutter out. But that's true, Pastor Nick. Look at it's a very, very nice call today. Yeah? So if you have... Yeah. Maybe one day some of... We just don't know, Pastor Nick, somebody will give you a very nice coat because you like you love coats. And um, go back to the topic. In reaching grace, God's grace is a blessing. Amen. Right? And He is able to make the grace abound in our lives. God blesses us so we can bless others. But there is a process in there. Before we can bless others, God will provide for us first. And after He provides for us, He enables us to be generous. Okay? So our generosity will allow other people to experience His grace and will give thanks to Him. Yeah? That is the so, uh, enriching grace. There you go. So remember that when God said to Abraham, I'm going to bless you, so you're going to be blessings to others. That is true. Amen. We're not just here to be for ourselves, but we are going to be blessings to others so that His name will be known and His kingdom will be known. And Amen. people will experience the God, the God that we serve. And today, right, I'm talking fast. Kaisa, are you okay? Is the last one is the inviting grace. So before we start, I'm going to show you this picture. What can you say? What can you say? It's what? If you are in that place, okay, what do you think? Are you just going to say, oh, it's beautiful? Are you not going to plunge into the water even though you don't have extra clothes? You're just going to stare, oh, the water is so nice. It's so inviting. It's beguiling. No? But you want to what? You want to experience it. You want to feel the, the coolness and the, you know, the, just the place itself. Another one. Oh, I'm making you hungry now. <laughs> so if you're on a diet, and if you see this food right in front of you, are you not going to have a cheat day? Are you still going to say, no, I pass? Or are you going to like, oh, no, 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 I can't, I can't control myself. I'm going to taste the cake. What do we have there? Oh, sumptuous meal. <laughs> right. So the pictures that I've shown you, I have a signal there at the back. It, they're what? They're inviting. It's like, come, taste me, feel me, come, experience me. And it's the same with the grace of God. Do you know that the grace of God is inviting us? Why? Let's find out. Okay, Marina. So, the goal of the series, why we do the Amazing Grace, let me just read this to you. The goal of the series is to present a practical view of grace that results in a deeper appreciation and experience of God's amazing and life-transforming grace. If you do not have a testimony in your life, that means that you never experienced the grace of God. Grace is a life-changing experience. It's a game-changer. The testimony that you can give to other people because, oh, I was like this before, and now I'm like this, I'm experiencing this because of the grace of God. And if I'm going to ask you, do you have any testimony? And you say, um, no, Jen. That means you haven't experienced the grace of God. Grace of God is what changes us from inside and out. And I'm going to go uh, deeper about that later. All right, so let's just review. For four weeks, we've been hearing this from Pastor Nick, from Jimmy, Brother Howard, and who's the other preacher? Um, Pastor from America, Pastor Sean. Uh, what is the meaning of grace? <laughs> grace is what? Ah, unmerited. That's the, the key word. Grace is the unmerited, undeserved. We do not deserve. Favor of God that saves us. So meaning grace brings salvation. And
and gives us the desire, eternal desire, and the power to do His will. It gives us a desire. Actually, grace does something in our hearts. Right? When you experience the grace of God, there is something that the grace is moving in. From inside to the outside. And for what? Why? It says there, so that we can do the will of God. The grace of God not only saves us, but empowers us to do the will of God. And if we're going to read the scripture in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 to 9, it says there that for it is by grace that we have been saved, not by your good works. But actually, is it the will of God that we're going to do good works? Is it the will of God? Yes. yes, it is. And we can only do the will of God through His grace because as human beings, our ability is very limited. So grace is a power. Partner with the Holy Spirit, then we can do the will of God. We can live out the purpose that God has given each one of us. Amen? Can I say amen? Amen. amen. I just want, I need an affirmation that what I'm talking here is, yes. <laughs> is true. Alright, so I also search for the meaning of that word inviting. Inviting grace. Inviting unmerited favor. Mm. There's so many things there. Appealing, attractive, charming, delightful, beguiling, encouraging, enticing, fascinating, pleasing, welcoming. So the grace of God is actually asking us, come, Amen. enter, come into Amen. the presence of God. So I come up with this, that God's inviting grace calls everyone to what? Enter, encounter, expect, and experience this amazing and life-transforming grace. Can we just give God a round of applause? Yeah. Oh, this is so exciting. Right. So, I'm going to give you a small, a short quiz. You know, I love giving quizzes <laughs> every time I preach. So, let's see. True or false? I really want you to read this and, you know, uh, think. And let's see if do you agree with me or no. Okay, everybody, let's read. Yes. Just because God invites you by His amazing grace into His presence doesn't mean it's not going to require some effort on our part. What do you think is your answer? True or false? Ah, later we're going to go back to that. Right. So, do you think because the grace of God is free, it's inviting us, do you think we don't need to we don't need to put on effort. We just have to wait. We just have to... Let's see. Uh, another quiz. This mountain is mentioned in the Bible. What do you think is this mountain called? Mount. Mount what? Mount. Oh, Pastor Julie. You're so clever. <laughs> Mount Sinai. Okay. What is the connection of Mount Sinai to grace? Okay. So today, we're going to take a look at the life of Moses. Do you know Moses in the Bible? Yes. Yeah? Yes. And we're going to look at the time that he spent with God. And it's very easy to overlook something fairly significant. All we know about Moses, he went up to the mountain. He, what? What did he do in the mountain? He talked to God, and then he came down with a tablet of Ten Commandments. But we did not see the effort that he did. This is the mountain, the Mount Sinai. Well, I'm not saying that that's there, but somewhere there, there's the Mount Sinai. So, Moses had to climb that mountain seven times as we know. As we know of. But probably more than that. Probably. Okay? But, um... That is just like, the, what, that's what they said, but I think it's more than that. And in some cases, having go back and forth with a little rest in between, 
I believe that it took a lot of energy and effort for him to be in the presence of God. Do you understand me now? Does yes. it make sense? Yes. That if you want to go to the presence of God, if Moses wants to spend time with the Lord, or if, if God wants Moses to receive a word from him, he has to climb that mountain. And we don't know how long it will take. Probably one hour, two hours, but the effort, because you want to be in the presence of God, he has to put this effort into it. Amen? Man. And, but in the Bible, they don't really mention that. All we know that Moses was the man of God, the messenger of God. He gave the Ten Commandments and that's all. There's no mention of what did he do. What's the experience? Mm. So, according to... Dallas Willard. Dallas Willard is an American philosopher and he is also a uh, uh, author of many Christian books. He said that grace is opposed. When you say opposed, it's against. Grace is opposed to earning, not effort. Okay. Personally, I believe that Jesus wants us to save us from our sin. But I also believe that Jesus also wants us to understand that it's not only saving us from our sin, but He also saved us for something. Do you get me? That the personal plan of God is not only to save us from our sin, but to save us for something. And that something is no other than a relationship he saved us so we can have a relationship with him an intimate um, meaningful relationship a union with God that's what that's why he gave us the grace so we can be saved and we can have a relationship with him you know from the very beginning the design of God is what so we can have partnership with Him. We can have a union with Him. Before the fall of man, the grace has already been there. Okay? All the resources, I remember Brother Peter said that um, because man, God loved man so much, before He put man in the Garden of Eden, He made sure that everything, everything that we need is already there. He created the plants. He created the animals. He just wanted to make sure that and all the needs of a human being will be met. And that is the grace of God. And when we fall, all right, that's why he said he sent Jesus Christ. But the original plan of God is that I will create Adam and Eve so I can express my love to him and so we can have this meaningful relationship. Do you agree with me? It's a partnership between God and human being. But even after the fall, God didn't stop. Send His grace to us. Yeah? That's the connection. So, you're all very, uh, so quiet. I want to say amen or no, you're amen or yes, Jen. <laughs> Alright. So, that's the grace of God. He wants us to return to the original plan of God. The good news of the gospel is that we are, we are invited we are invite, We are not invited one time. It's not that we are invited one time to be near God, but that we have an open invitation by His grace to confidently come before Him. It's always open. The problem is not with God. The problem is with us. The problem is our attitude. Okay? Our laziness. Yes? <laughs> yeah? You know, I, I experienced this it's some once in a while. I would, you know, I, I don't want to read my Bible. I don't want But, you know, before, I didn't want to go to church. I don't want to go to life group. I don't want to have a fellowship. It's because I just don't want to. And I just realized that I am, I have already taken for granted the grace of God that He has given to me. It's always an open invitation, but it takes an effort for us to remain in that grace. Do you get me? The grace of God is there, 
but there should be a partnership between us, okay, between us and God to remain in the presence of God. Okay? Amen. 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 Mm. I'm just making it. Right, let's go to our main text, I think. Okay, our main text for today. <clears throat> main text. That is in Hebrew 4, 14, 16. So, I just want us to get some insight into God's amazing grace and help us in times of need, especially as it relates to consistently, devotionally connecting with Him on a relational level. So, if you find yourself right now, I'm just so, yeah, I'm just, I'm having difficulty trying to connect with God. I'm having some struggles right now and I feel that God is so far from me. God is... I feel like God is not hearing me. I can't experience that peace that I want. So this verse will help us to reconnect with, uh, will give us insight, right? So everybody, let's read from Hebrew 4, chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is, what? Living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword. Penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, it is able to judge the thoughts and intention of the heart. So I underline the word. What did I underline? Everybody read. Living, Living and effective. So the word is not just dead words on a page. What am I talking about? The word of God is this one. I always carry with me. Do you have the word of God with you? Yes. Your phone? Yes. No? This one. Because when you read this one, these are not just like plain words. It has the ability to change your life. You may not be understand it, but if you really like, you know, spend time meditating on the word of God, it is what? Alive and effective. So what is alive and effective looks like? So in Isaiah 55, 11, what does it say? Everybody, let's read. This is God saying. So, it does not return to me unfulfilled. My word performs my purpose and fulfills the mission I send it out to accomplish. So when God speaks, it becomes a law. We go back again. Whatever God says, it becomes a mandate, a decree, a constitution. He cannot go back. When He says it, we settle on it. Right? So that's why when I say, I'm going to forgive you, nobody in the earth could stop God from forgiving you. And He will make sure that you will experience that forgiveness from God. When He says that I am going to save you and show you my mercy, He will do that. And no calamities or sickness or diseases or any weapons will be able to stop God from fulfilling that. Because when He says it, He'll make sure that He will accomplish it. That's, that's the God that we serve. And in the kingdom, okay, we can always trust His word. When he says to you, I am going to restore, is it God's, is it God's, um, is it God's will that our relationships will be restored? Yes. Is it God's will that, that, um, we're going to live in this life, you know, clinging to him and be dependent to him? Yes, that is will. And if that is his will, he is going to make sure that it is going to happen. God is not like human being. Sometimes, oh, my husband can affirm to this. I would say, oh, tomorrow. And then tomorrow, I change my mind. I do tomorrow again. Oh, tomorrow again. Oh, tomorrow came back. You know, I didn't fulfill it. I did. But when God says yes, it's yes. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. So, in the context, the Word of God let me just read this to you. This is long. The Word of God is about much more than words in a book. 
and has much to do with the presence of Jesus. So when we are reading this book here, okay, it becomes personified. You know what personified means? It becomes, it represents in a form of a person. So the Word of God is Jesus Himself. So when you read the Bible, meaning you are spending the time with Jesus. It's the same with who are married couples here. Or if you are hurting someone. When you send a love letter to your loved ones, and if you're reading the love letter, you just don't read the empty, you just don't read the paper, right? The words in there. But you're reading it as if the one writing to you the letter is saying the words directly to you. And it's the same with God. When we read the Bible, this is God talking to you talking to me. That's why when we spend time reading the Bible, our relationship with Him becomes deeper and intimate. And that's the only way that we can, you know, that we can know God. There's so many ways we can. But mainly, Jesus reveals Himself through His Word. And that takes a lot of effort. I find it hard to wake up in the morning 3 o'clock to just read my Bible because I feel like I don't understand everything. But I have to intentionally do it. I have to deliberately do it. Because if I wake up 6 o'clock in the morning, I can't concentrate anymore. My children are running around, Mommy! Shower! Mommy! Where's my... Everything is in chaos. Deliberately, 3 o'clock in the morning, ask my husband, yes. my phone will alarm. Meaning, this is my time Amen. to spend with God. I want to be in His presence. Lord, I want to be with you. I want, before I start my day, I want to hear from you. It takes an effort. And it takes grace for me to wake up 3 o'clock in the morning to really open my Bible and just, you know, talk with God. How about you? What kind of effort do you do to spend time in the presence of God? I want you to ask yourself. Because if you want, our, if you want your relationship with God works, you must do your effort. It's the same with us. All of us here, we have families. If you want your relationship to work with your husband, you both make an effort. If you want your children to know that you love them, you make an effort. Because love is not only contained in words. Love is expressed in action. And you do it. Right? You do it. They said that action speaks louder than words. So it's what God is telling us. You say, you want to spend time with me, you want to know me, then do it. But the only way that we can do it is through the grace of God. Amen? Amen. 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 Right? Give a round of applause. Okay. Next. So that's the first 12. Now let's take a look at verse 12. Okay. Oh, no, no, no. Not yet. We're still there. For the word of God is living and effective and it doesn't work. <laughs> and whoo, there, sharper than any double-edged sword. Have you seen the sword? Yeah. Are you? I. If you see the sword, are you going to touch it? What happened to you if you cut? If you touch it? What? You're gonna cut yourself, aren't you? And it's the same with the word of God. It is like a double-edged sword. Let me just read my note here. It is not a blunt force or a raw power. It's like a surgical instrument that can completely cut through all the nonsense and rebellion and fully. You know what? I'm not, I'm not fond of cooking. I'm fond of baking. So when I married Romel, I'm just so happy because someone has to cook for me every day. <laughs> but one time, he was at work and I was very, very hungry. I had no choice, but I had to you know, cook for myself. So I went to the kitchen, I took the knife, and okay, I started cutting the, I think, meat. 
frustrated because the knife was very dull, like so dull that I could even cut my, I could even try to cut my, my arm and it wouldn't hurt at all. So you know what I did? I just took the knife as if the knife is very, like, you know, can respond to me and I said, you are such a useless rubbish knife and you belong in the rubbish bin. Ow. So, <laughs> so, the word of God is not a blunt kind of thing. It could cut. Cut what? Cut anything that is not helpful with our spiritual growth and maturity. The word of God rebukes us. It tells us which part of our character, part of our you know, our journey with Him has to be changed. And, you know, sometimes cutting is not really a very nice experience at all. Right? Pain. What else? Soreness. Because when you cut, I mean, you know when you remember cut? It gives you that awful feeling. And sometimes God is doing the same in our life. We experience the pain, but after the pain, but we become better. He needs to cut, you know, like a diamond, a ring. Before a diamond turns into a very nice and a priceless diamond, it has to go through a lot of cuttings. And if the diamond could only talk, <laughs> could you remember? Could you imagine how many? Please stop! Please stop! Don't do that! Don't cut me! Don't. Maybe a million times or a thousand times. Just for diamond to be a priceless one, it has to do a lot of cutting and edging and a lot of polishing. And it's the same with us. If you allow the Word of God to do the cutting and the edging in your life, we are going to be like a diamond in a rock. You know that, that expression? You are already a diamond, but you become a priceless one, a valuable one, when you undergo what? Cuttings and testings and polishing. And it's the same with us. You can't say, no, I'm just a useless person yet. They said that I'm better, better for nothing. No! You are already precious, but you become more valuable if we allow this Word of God transform our lives. And we can only do this by what? By the grace of God only by the grace of God amen, amen. amen. get so excited are you still okay amen. yes right yes Jack. yes Jack then we go to the next chapter no next verse not this one All right and says here, no creature is hidden, no creature is hidden from him, but all from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Do you know any place where we can hide from God? If do you know, please tell me. Because I want to go there. <laughs> no. Because there's nothing about us that God doesn't know. Even before we are put into our mother's womb, God knows already what you're going to be look like. What you're going to become when you grow up. Yeah. What is your life going to be? There is no secret that God will not expose in the light. Right? Nothing is hidden with Him. Even in the darkness, God will still see us. In the Bible, when you give in secret, God will what? Reward you openly. When you disobey in secret, God will disgrace you publicly. So this is not about us trying to sneak around and do things behind God and you know, uh, making a false impression about other people because we cannot mock God. We cannot. You cannot fool God. You're only fooling yourself. Okay? There is nothing we do that God will not eventually know. And He will expose it. That's who He is. And everything that we do, we have to give account to Him. Nothing is invisible to God. God's 
word has the ability to uncover our hidden aspects and make them known. Give a secret. I said that. I have already said that. So even in the darkness, we cannot hide from God. And Hebrews 14. So this is about Jesus. Okay? This is about Jesus now. Our great high priest. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, which is Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. So Jesus comes along as a true... You know, we don't, we don't really understand the... the um, what do you call this one? The uh, illustration of the high priest. What are you talking about the high priest yet? Okay. In the Old Testament, priest is very important to the Jews. Why? Because they are the people who make sacrifices to God. Okay? You cannot just you cannot just appoint someone to go and make a sacrifice to God. It should be from the lineage of the uh, Aaron. The first priest was Aaron. Okay? And if that priest did not do exactly what God told him to do, automatically it means death. Right? But the priest has to enter once a year, they have to enter into the Holy of Holies to make sacrifices, to make a sacrifice to God. When the priest comes out alive, meaning the people, the Israel has been forgiven from their sin. So for us, what is the connection with this one? We don't have, we don't need the priest and uh, someone to sacrifice for us. Jesus himself was the uh, was the high priest. He sacrificed for us and he himself is the sacrifice for all of our sin. Amen? So once and for all, there's no other qualified but only Jesus Christ. You see that? The Son of God. And there are two things about Christ here that why you see the true high priest on two levels. The first one, Jesus is like us. He came to earth 100% human being. Right? Like you and me. He is truly like human and he knows exactly what our weakness are like. He experienced them, although he never seen. So we have no right to say, God, you don't understand me. You don't understand my feeling. I am in a very deep uh, trouble right now. I am so depressed, Lord, and you cannot understand me. No. There is nothing that you that we 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 go through that God cannot understand because everything when he came on earth, he experienced them all. He is like us, but there is just one difference. What? He never sinned. He was tempted and he was um he was tempted, but he did not sin. And another one, Jesus is our true high priest because he is not like us in what sense but he knew all our weakness yet he did not sin he is the man if there is a man where we can you know consider as a great model and we can con consider as a great leader there's no other than but Jesus his life is a true example of how are we going to live our life he is the standard Right? He is the standard. He is the high priest like us. He can relate to us human beings. But he is not like us because what? He did not sin. He is so perfect. We are not. He is so holy. We are not. That's who he is. And, and chapter 15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus is not just only like a God, a, okay, king, but he doesn't understand. He sympathizes with us. Are you going through depression? Are you going through a lot of uh, anxiety? Are you going through, uh, what else, other problems we have? So many problems. You know, the only person that you can come into and can relate is Jesus Christ. There is a story of a boy. Do you allow me to give you a story? I'm almost done. Just three minutes. There is a boy. He went out to the city and then he found the signage, Puppies for Sale. 
And so he went to the he went to the shop and then he asked the man, "How much is the cost of the puppy?" And the man said, "Uh, two thousand baht, maybe around that, two thousand baht." And his face was like sad because the it was a bit too too much for him. And he said, "Um, could I just?" Anyway, look at. I would like to see the puppies. There, is that okay? So the man called the mom of the puppies, and then the mom went, and then four puppies, very happy, wiggling their tails, you know, came near to the man. And then, right around in the corner, there was one pup. He was dragging his leg. And then the boy said, "What happened to that pup?" And the man said that. I brought him to the vet, but the vet said that he had no hip socket, so he's going to be crippled forever. He cannot walk, he can't run, he is going to be like that forever. And the boy said, oh, "I want that puppy. Out of the four puppies, I want that." But the man said, "Oh, son, you don't understand." If you're going to take this puppy, you cannot bring the puppy outside and walk with him. You cannot play with him because he's crippled. And the boy said, he put his leg in front. He pulled his hand, revealing his brains. The boy is also crippled, one leg. And he said to the man, that dog needs love. He needs care. This, sorry, he can relate because he himself is the same. And he said that I want the puppy because nobody will love the puppy the way I would do. And it's the same with Jesus. Nobody can relate to you, even if you go to the best psychologist, the best counselor. Nobody can relate to you, and nobody can help you. More than Jesus. This is only a limited illustration of what Jesus is. But as a high priest, this is who He is to us. He sympathizes with us. He gives us the, you know, the ability to empathize with every situation we are in. So that is the grace of God. Do you get me now? That's the grace of God, and and I just. I just can't explain it, but I can't experience it. And on 16, this is what God wants us, wants you and me to do. Because the grace is already free. He has already sent His invitation. And this is what He's saying us. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. God is asking us to come and have a relationship with me. If we have a relationship with God, we, you know, we can just barge into His presence anytime as we want with boldness, knowing that we don't present ourselves because we are good. I donated two million baht in a in a uh, charity. I just did well today. I did not say no. We come with confidence to Him, knowing of what Jesus Christ did for us. We come to Him presenting His Son Jesus Christ. It's not us anymore. It's Jesus Christ, and so we come to Him in the in 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 the throne of grace. So how do we come to Him in the throne of grace? Through what? Through prayer. Do you get what I mean? Prayer. That's the only way we can communicate with God. Our prayer. Our prayer means that we come to Him because we need Him. Most of us, we do not pray because we do not realize how needy we are. Does it make sense? We don't pray because we thought that we can handle everything on our own. But actually, prayer is an acknowledgement that our need is not partial, but our need is total. 
we go to prayer because Lord, I need your help 50% and my and my and my and from me, for myself 50%. No. There's no things like that. We come to prayer because we we I don't know that. <laughs> we we uh we realize it was the other term for realize. We know because we understand that 100% of help will come from Him. And there's nothing that we can boast that, God, I did this. Only 20% of your help I need. Can you say that to God? So prayer is not partial. Prayer is total. 100%. And so when we come in prayer to Him, just like a father, just like a father, God will not say, hmm, in Tagalog, we say, yan kasi, blah, blah, blah. God will not blame you. God will not scold you. God will not belittle you. But what will God do? God will take you to His side like a father will take a child and protect him. And because we come to Him, okay, because we come to Him, because of that grace, God will what? God will show mercy. And we find what? Grace to help us in time of need. When do we need help? That's the question. When do we need help? We need help every time. So we approach God every time. We don't need help, oh, I need help two years from now, Lord. Or maybe next month, or three months. We need help at all times. So the invitation of God is for us at all times. You come and approach me, and I am here as a father, I'm going to listen to you. He may not be always ready to answer our prayers, yes, at all times, but he does listen. The good thing about God is He is a very good listener. He does not put every prayer into waste. There is no unnecessary prayer for God. Whatever you present to Him, whatever you petition to Him, whether it is His will or not His will, He listens and He answers. And it takes the grace of God for us to be truly honest of what we feel. When you approach God, you know that the thing here, it says here, we approach Him with boldness. Meaning, there is already a relationship. Can you just show to a king without him knowing you? Of course not! In a kingdom, when a king is talking and somebody just barge in without an audience, without like a formal, uh, how to say, audience for a king, death. You die. Disrespectful. But the only person who can do that in front of the king is no other than who? Children. Children. Are we not the children of God? So, that's, that's, the, that's the benefit. That's the relationship. Because we are sons and daughters. Okay? We are sons and daughters at any time, in any place. We could just barge into the presence of God and He likes it. He likes it. Because you're just telling God, God, I need you. I need your help. Would you help me? And God is very happy about it. That is His expertise. And He is very willing to help us. For those who receive Jesus as what? For those who receive Jesus as their, as their Lord and Savior, He gave them the right to be their sons and daughters. And that's who we are. We are the sons and daughters of the King. There is no limit when it comes to accessing into His kingdom. There is no limit when it comes to accessing into His presence. We just have to need the grace. We just have to put an effort into it. Grace is already free. It's already there. It's given. Now it's your turn. It's my turn. Put an effort there so we can maintain that. Maintain the relationship 
maintain your salvation. What else? Maintain our uh, mercy. Right? We do not deserve. But still He gave. Still He gave. And the last slide I have here is, uh, oh my gosh. Uh, there's one more. We can absolutely receive God's grace to bring us into our relationship and continue to receive His grace so that we can grow in that relationship. Grace will help us grow our relationship with God. Okay? Not your own ways. I mean, you can have your different ways of, okay, oh, maybe Lord, tomorrow you can plan. Maybe tomorrow, Lord, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do that. But without the grace of God, you won't be able to meet all those expectations that you have put in your little notebook. So, the question is, this is the question now, okay? Grace is already here. The invitation is already there. What keeps us to come into God's presence to receive mercy and grace. What keeps you and me? Why we can't receive that grace, that mercy? First, when we view sin as unreal, irrelevant, or a laughable idea. We need grace, why? Because sin has separated us from the love of the Father. If you do not take sin as serious as a death, you're in trouble. When you take when you take sin as like a joke, joke thing, you know, the value of grace becomes lesser. You do not appreciate the grace God has given you. When you look at sin as like this, okay, so you just don't care, carefree life, what? Because if you don't, if you don't understand that you have sin, then you don't need a savior. You don't need Jesus Christ. You don't need that grace. Next, another one. Because we thought that we have free access to God, doesn't mean it costs anything. Grace is there, but it's like we're taking things for granted. Okay? Oh, anyway, there's grace, and I can do this. But we have to think that Jesus paid the cost, and He paid it with His blood with this life so we can experience grace in our lives. Amen? And the third one, when we have no time to read and meditate on God's Word, the best way to avoid obedience is to avoid work. <laughs> if you don't want to obey God, don't read the Word. Because the Word of God will really tell you the don'ts and do in the lives, in our lives. It's the standard. So if you don't want other hustle about your lives, you just want to live your life carefree, don't read the Word. And the more we don't read the Word, the more we become worldly people. Instead of word, worthy people, we become worldly. Our thinking... Our attitude, it becomes the pattern of the world, right? Because you don't read the Word. So what you put in your mind, what the media tells you, what the, what the world tells you to do, that's all the, you think they're right, but they're not right. Yeah? And the last one is when we allow shame to determine how much God desires us in His presence. You know what? Shame and guilt and condemnation, this is what keeps us from approaching God's throne. The Lord isn't look, you know, He does not look at you. He does not look at you as a, as a sinner or He doesn't look at you as a person with, with uh, problems or difficulty. He looks at you as his creation and he loves you. Only you come and approach him and ask forgiveness and receive that healing from him. I mean, you know, God, I would say that God doesn't care about our past. He knew our past, but he doesn't want us to dwell in the past. What you are right now, what you are right now is not as important of what you're going to be in the future. Okay? Your decision, you make it today. 
and the decision that you make today will really affect what you are in the future. God sees you as his son and daughter. You make a mistake, you come to him, you ask for forgiveness, be sincere about it, and he will release the grace and forgiveness to you. That's who he is. And I don't know how are you going to look at grace in that, in that view, or how are you going to look at God. But I believe that Jesus and his grace is the same. It's one. So this is a challenge, guys. When I was studying this and, you know, my children are really annoying. I cannot really study properly because one of them, Mommy, could I play with that? You can't play right now, okay, because I, I'm, I'm studying. And I just realized if, if God is doing something and then if I come to Him and ask Him for even like a maybe 60 seconds, 59 seconds of his time would I going to will God respond in the way that I would respond to my children and I just realized that oh my gosh I am so important that God will really give a time to listen to me sometimes we don't have to say a word you just have to approach his throne of grace with boldness with confidence. That confidence does not come from your own good work that you feel about yourself. That confidence will come from what Jesus did on the cross that you represent today. So I want everybody to please stand up. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. His grace is amazing. His grace is abounding. His grace is incredible. And we just want to thank you, God, because we do not deserve. If we could only understand the meaning of, you know, punishment, undeserved, unmerited, Lord, we will look up to you, God, as someone that we really need in our lives. And we want to thank you, Father, that you freely give. You freely give. And we receive your grace, God. It may not be always easy every day, Lord. It may not be always easy. But you promise. You promise that you're going to give us grace. That your grace is sufficient enough so we can go on. <coughs> We can continue to live on. We can continue to walk even when we are hurting. Even when we are, we just don't know where to go, but we know, God, that you will lead us. We want to thank you, Jesus. You are such a generous God, a good, good Father to us. Thank you so much for loving us in so many ways, Lord, that we don't, we don't, but still you embrace us the moment that we you know turn away from the worldliness the moment that we turn away God from our own self self greed Paul we become worldly our thinking our attitude it becomes the pattern of the world right because you don't read the word so what you put in your mind what the media tells you what the what the world tells you to do that's all the you think they're right but they're not right yeah and the last one is when we allow shame to determine how much god desire us in his presence you know what shame and guilt and condemnation this is what keep us from approaching God's throne. The Lord isn't look, no, He does not look at you. He does not look at you as a as a sinner, or He doesn't look at you as a person with, with um, problems or difficulty. He looks at you as His creation and He loves you. Only you come and approach Him and ask forgiveness. 
and receive that healing from Him. I mean, you know, God, I would say that God doesn't care about our past. He knew our past, but He doesn't want us to dwell in the past. What you are right now, what you are right now is not as important as what you're going to be in the future. Okay? Your decision, you make it today. And the decision that you make today will really affect what you are in the future. God sees you as His son and daughter. You make a mistake, you come to Him, you ask for forgiveness, be sincere about it, and He will release the grace and forgiveness to you. That's who He is. And I don't know how are you going to look at grace in that, in that view, or how are you going to look at God. But I believe that Jesus and His grace is the same. It's one. So, this is a challenge, guys. When I was studying this and, you know, my children are really annoying. I cannot really study properly. Because one of them, Mommy, could I play with that? You can't play right now, okay? Because I, I'm, I'm in study. And I just realized if, if God is doing something, and then if I come to Him and ask Him for even like a, maybe 60 sec 59 seconds of His time, would I going to, will God respond in the way that I would respond to my children? And I just realized that, oh my gosh, I am so important that God will really give a time to listen to me. Sometimes we don't have to say a word. You just have to approach His throne of grace with boldness, with confidence. That confidence does not come from your own good work that you feel about yourself, that confidence will come from what Jesus did on the cross that you represent today. So I want everybody to please stand up. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. His grace is amazing. His grace is abounding. His grace is incredible. And we just want to thank you, God, because we do not deserve if we could only understand the meaning of you know punishment undeserved unmerited Lord we will look up to you God as someone that we really need in our lives and we want to thank you Father that you freely give you freely give And we receive your grace, God. It may not be always easy every day, Lord. It may not be always easy. But you promise. You promise that you're going to give us grace. That your grace is sufficient enough so we can go on. We can continue to live on. We can continue to walk even when we are hurting. Even when we are... We just don't know where to go, but we know, God, that you will lead us. We want to thank you, Jesus. You are such a generous God, a good, good Father to us. Thank you so much for loving us in so many ways, Lord, that we, we don't, we don't. But still, you embrace us. The moment that we, you know, turn away from the worldliness, the moment that we turn away, God, from our own self, self-greed. Just from our own. Just from our own, God. Lord, you welcome us. And you show mercy. You extend your grace. And you lavish us with your love. Thank you so much, Jesus. And even what we are experiencing right now, the phenomenal right now where viruses in China, God, 
as some of us were alarmed. And the other day, I was opening the, the Facebook, and I found, I think, one of the church members here. I think she posted that there was an open letter from a pastor from Wuhan in China. And the, le the letter was, it was really heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. Because we knew there are some brothers and sisters in Christ in China, and yet we look on, we're looking at the Chinese people like they are the worst people in the whole world. I was convicted because, you know, I would really like to protect my family, but what God revealed to me, it's not you who will protect your family, it's me, it's God. So this is the time that we're going to ask God to just show us His grace because God is able to save. God is able to restore. God is able to, you know, bring back everything into an, its original plan. And we want to thank you, Lord, and right now, God, we just want to unite in prayer as a community because we know that there are people in China, Lord, all around the world who are suffering from this disease from this virus God and we are going to stand firm in your word father that you said in your word that no weapon form against us will be able to prosper because you have bought us with a price with the blood of Jesus and we pray father God and we just declare right now that you are going to remove that you're going to meet this virus God bring it back somewhere else where it belongs and will never affect the people around the world and even for those who are living in China right now some of them they know you some of them they don't know you and I Lord God this is the time the perfect time to show your grace Father and once again we pray for them we pray Father God for your mercy we pray Father God for your protection we pray Father that you're going to you know let these people know that you are God and you are in control of everything that this is going to be a testimony Father that will be bring glory to your name Lord we thank you Jesus because God this thing is not new to you you knew that this is going to happen and you have already the solution we want to thank you Father that everything is under your control it's in the palm of your hands God we trust you we put our confidence in you lord because we know that you're not going to fail us you're not going to fail the people out there thank you so much for supernatural covering and protection lord thank you for the grace thank you god thank you thank you thank you we give you all the glory father thank you for being our high priest thank you god that we could come to you jesus we could approach you. We could just march into your presence. And you're just so ready to listen to us, God. Thank you for the relationship. Thank you for the union. Thank you for the intimacy. In the name of Jesus. Help us, Lord. Help us, Jesus. Amen.